Uh, I'm Dr. Daniel Neely, my professor of ophthalmology at Indiana University uh, School of Medicine, where I practice pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus. And today we're going to try something new. Today we're going to discuss um, approximately five strabismus cases that I've been involved with. And um, having been a consult advisor to people around the world for the last uh, 10 or 15 years, I've answered approximately a thousand consults, and during that time, I can tell you that um, if you ever felt alone, well, you're really not. We all face the same problems and see the same kinds of difficult cases. Um, and so what I've done is I've kind of picked five representative cases of what I see commonly. And these cases aren't perfect, but I think they are reflective of what happens in the real world. And, and each case has been selected to highlight a specific um, teaching point that we'll go through. Um, as we do this, also, um, I'll try to take any questions that come up in real time. And um, if time permits, we'll, uh, we'll have some other discussion at the end as well. Um, and Lawrence, you can see my screen now, is that correct? Uh, nope, you have to share your screen for us. Okay, my apologies, let me get that going. Okay, so I assume you have it now. Yep, we see it. Okay, uh, before we start, one thing I'd like to point out is that uh, um, all of the CyberSite material is available um, at the CyberSite homepage. And you can see there's an upcoming list of upcoming lectures. And I think there's some very interesting material coming up uh, with Dr. Rab continuing his uh, uh, strabismus lectures, and then Dr. Chula with the retinal OCT. And uh, uh, you can see that there was just a ptosis, and thyroid eye disease. We have quite a diversity of uh, really interesting subjects coming up. And down here at the bottom, we see Dr. Uh, Donnie Sue, good friend of mine, doing a presentation on 3D printing, which I think is going to hold a lot of promise uh, uh, for us in our practices and uh, access to tools. So some very interesting things going on. Uh, also keep in mind that all of these lectures are recorded and that uh, by going to the library section, you can see all of the recorded lectures that have been given. Uh, we have the surgical videos as well um, on different topics. And then, of course, there are the uh, textbooks and manuals um, from Morbus and other sources that are available free to everyone. Um, so let me open up my PowerPoint. And what I'll be doing as we do this is I'll be toggling back and forth between uh, the Orbis um, um, CyberSite Consult website as well as this, uh, this PowerPoint where I've highlighted some of the teaching points from each case. Uh, the first case that I've chosen today is, is this one. Uh, this is from uh, one of my new uh, friends, uh, Dr. Yanti in uh, Makassar, Indonesia, where I was this past year. And uh, to summarize this case, we have a 20-year-old male with a history of diplopia. Uh, this patient has an exo deviation, which has been gradual and onset over the last year. And uh, there's no history of trauma or other systemic disease. Um, I'll show you a collage here, and then what we'll do is I'll open up the case and we can look at these images uh, one by one. Um, after we've looked at these images, we'll launch into a poll question. I'll get your opinion as to what you think about this case. Uh, then we'll discuss the differential diagnosis briefly and then some of the treatment options. And uh, again, to point out, these cases aren't perfect and we don't always have follow-up on these cases, but what I'm mostly interested in is showing you how um, the deductive process goes on as you evaluate complex to business cases, what should be going through your head, what information is important, and then um, what do you need to do to help that patient and how do you choose which muscles to operate on. And it's not always so much about how much you do, it's about track, uh, picking the correct muscles and doing the right thing. Uh, so let's open up this case. Uh, let me sign myself in here and this first case is 25618 which I'll get to here in a second. All right so starting from the uh, 
the home page here. Um, there's a search function up here if you're not aware of that. And you can search by a multitude of different um, keywords, dates, uh, people's names, but I'll be putting in the case number here, which is 25618. And we'll bring up our first case as we do this. And the reason I want to pull these up like this rather than just show you PowerPoint slides is I want to be able to scroll through and show you the photographs in real time. One th another thing I'll point out here is you see that the current consult form takes up quite a bit of real estate. And I'm, I'm happy to announce that later this week, you're going to see a new condensed form of this uh, revised template, uh, which I think will make uh, life a lot easier and uh, the presentation of the information a lot more concise for everybody. But here's our first case and again uh, center image is always the primary position and here's our preview. You can see that he does have an exo deviation of the right eye. Uh, it appears to have some ptosis and uh, it's hard to tell if there's any vertical deviation there. When we look at his uh, Motility first. I like to go to side gazes first, and it looks like his uh, motility in right gaze is pretty normal. And then let's go left gaze. You can see in left gaze that his right eye is not coming in very well. He's not even getting to the midline, and I would describe that as a minus four uh, adduction deficit. And up gaze, also again the left eye goes normally, but you can see that right eye is not fully elevating. And here, up and to the right, it's definitely not elevating very well on that right eye. And then let's look at down and to the right. So the right eye is also not depressing. Left eye looks like it's moving pretty normally in all directions. Uh, and again, up and to the left, the right eye is a little elevated, but not adducting very well. Uh, there's almost, again, zero adduction. And then... Uh, not much depression in the adducted position either. So right eye appears to, or left eye appears to be normal, and we have some significant motility uh, restrictions on the uh, on the right eye. So let's go into our first poll question. Um, looking at these motility photos, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis? Um, Number one, a third nerve palsy. Uh, number two, a fourth nerve palsy. Number three, a sixth nerve palsy. Or number four, uh, Duane syndrome. And as you astutely uh, have determined, yeah, given this many extraocular muscles involved, uh, third nerve palsy, 91% uh, of you agree is the most likely diagnosis. And I agree this is a rather um, uh, mostly obvious diagnosis, but the reason I've chosen this case is because this is one of the most difficult problems that we face. Uh, these are really complex because you have such a limitation of, of uh, uh, motility and functioning muscles here. I mean, we can see we basically have only a lateral rectus and maybe a superior oblique to work with. Now, one of the things that you need to, uh, that comes into the, uh, it's important with third nerves in particular is um, when you have an isolated third nerve palsy, um, whether or not the pupil is involved is, is very critical. And that is because the pupil and motor fibers tend to run on the outside of the uh, nerve. And so when you have compressive lesions, um, the pupil frequently is affected, all right? So if you have a dilated pupil, um, then that increases the probability that there might be an aneurysm or other compressive lesion involved. Uh, however, the uh, microvascular third nerves tend to affect the deeper portions of the third nerve. And so um, a lot of times the pupil is spared. So if the pupil is spared, this tends to be a less dangerous situation. 
And again, we're mostly then thinking microvascular diabetes and hypertension. And I think that this case is kind of concerning in the fact that it was a gradual onset and it's a young person uh, who really probably doesn't have much in the way of microvascular risk factors. All right. Uh, but this, this particular um, uh, uh, diagram, this is from Ed Buckley's chapter in uh, David Plager's strabismus book, which I think is very interesting. This is uh, Strabismus Surgery 2004. The thing I like about this book in particular is that um, it presents a patient and then you get the opinion of three, four, maybe even five international experts. And, and you'll see that they all have different opinions as to um, what should be done in many cases. And I think that's very helpful to see that there's more than one correct way to do things. So in this particular patient, um, because the pupil was involved, and, uh, and we actually, um, it's hard to see that in the photographs. Um, unfortunately, these in particular, the way the photographs are, I can't enlarge them, but we do have up here, uh, we know that the, um, here we have that the right pupil is abnormal in size. Um, so because this, this patient uh, had a history of uh, a dilated pupil and an isolated third nerve, then uh, this, uh, the multiple slice um, CT angiography was performed and um, uh, fortunately uh, no, no abnormality was found and no aneurysm was found, but um, the cause of the third nerve uh, remained elusive. So we don't, we don't know why this patient had a third nerve palsy. Uh, and I think one still needs to be on guard in regards to um, aneurysm in this case. All right, um, so how do you deal with these total third nerve palsies? Well, uh, basically you have a couple options. You can weaken the two remaining active muscles which are forcing the eye down and out. And predominantly that's the exotropia from the lateral rectus. And secondarily you get the hypotropia from if the um, superior oblique is still functioning. Um, you also can strengthen the paralytic medial rectus. However, it's paralytic. You're probably not going to get a great amount of effect from that. And then if we have a partial third nerve, then we always have the option of transpositions. Um, but I think if you're looking at what's the biggest bang for the buck, and that's to do something to the lateral rectus. Uh, some people like to do the very large recessions, and, and we're talking really large recessions. You know, typically a lateral rectus recession might be eight millimeters or so. Uh, but here we see that we're trying to get the lateral rectus behind the equator. So recessing um, that lateral rectus 14, 16 millimeters, as far, pretty much as far back as you can, and preferably doing that by suturing it directly to the globe. Uh, if you do this on a hangback, then that has the option of the lateral rectus kind of creeping forward. So a hangback is easier, but may not give you as much effect. Um, other people would recommend extirpating or removing as much of the lateral rectus as you can from even cutting all the way back to uh, where the lateral rectus exit through posterior tenons capsule. So that's an extirpation. Uh, um, now, even when you do these two things, a recession or an extirpation, the lateral rectus is still pulling on the periorbital tissues. And so you'll frequently, you'll see there's still abduction effort, even though they've had these really uh, extreme surgeries. And so many people have now gone to fixating the lateral rectus to the orbital wall. And you can do this, you need a very curved needle to do this. Um, and one example is um, written here, this um, C1 taper point, which is cardiovascular needle. It's a heavy needle and it's curved. And if you disinsert the lateral rectus from the globe and then suture it to the periosteum, um, just, in, just posterior to orbital rim, well now, when that lateral rectus contracts, it doesn't move anything. So it makes it very difficult to have an abduction effect on, on the globe. Um, and so that's, that's another nice way to really isolate that lateral rectus. Um, and a lot of times combining these two with a very large resection of the medial rectus. Now the medial rectus is dead, so we're not really expecting to get a lot of effect from that. But what you're doing is you're resecting it such a large amount that you create a restriction. And so we're talking about resections of 10, 14 millimeters. And you really want to see that that eye is actually in an esotropic position at the end of the surgery, uh, because you know that it's going to kind of stretch out and loosen over time. And if there is a hypotropia, you can super place that. So move the resected medial rectus upward, and that will help bring the eye up to correct the hypotropia. 
Um, conversely, if you have a partial third, you can move it the other way. Um, if you happen to have a hyper, shift the medial down, and uh, that'll take the eye down. Now, the predominant reason, however, so you, you can shift the medial up or down. However, uh, you know, most of the time, the reason you have the hypotropia is because the superior oblique still works, the fourth cranial nerve. Now, it doesn't always. The third nerve and the fourth nerve are right adjacent to each other, so sometimes the same process affects them both. Uh, but if you can identify that the superior oblique is functioning, and you do this by having the patient look down, um, preferably while you're looking through the slit lamp, and look and see what the iris is doing. If you see in cyclotorsion of the iris as they look down, that tells you that the superior oblique is functioning. And so uh, doing a tenotomy to um, prevent that hypotropia uh, can be quite helpful. And this is usually performed as a secondary procedure after you, after you might um, uh, go ahead and do the medial rectus resection. And the reason is if, if, the, uh, if you do the medial rectus resection and yet you're still exotropic, rather than just tenotomizing the superior oblique, you might choose to alternatively transpose the superior oblique. It's not something we do very commonly, but you can shorten the superior oblique tendon and move it so it's adjacent to the superior corner of the medial rectus. And by doing that, you create a bit of a tether so that you can help pull that eye in. I don't think there's a lot of active adduction from this, um, but it certainly can um, be one more way to tether that eye in to help with these really difficult cases. All right, so that's, that's our first case. Um, I'll see if I can... Uh... All right, so uh, taking the first question here, uh, Dr. Chakraborty asks, uh, what's the justification for fixating the lateral rectus five to six millimeters behind the orbital rim? It is technically very difficult, and I would agree with that. It is technically very difficult, and um, I, uh, it's, I think it's um, more difficult if you have the wrong needle. If you have the right needle, uh, which is something heavy and curved, uh, then it's not that difficult to do. Um, but I think uh, from what I've seen, a lot of places it's very difficult to find useful needles for this. Using a regular strabismus needle doesn't work very well. They're too light and they just bend and break. Now you don't necessarily need to expose the periosteum of the, la of the lateral orbital wall. Um, I do this with a rather blind pass just by pressing the tissues um, flat against the orbital wall with a ribbon retractor or Damar retractor or Barbie retractor and then just trying to get a bite into the, through the tissue and into the periosteum uh, with that large C1 needle. So yes, it can be difficult, but it also can be rather effective. Uh, but you don't have to do it. If, if, if you don't have an appropriate needle to do this, then just do the uh, extirpation or large recession and combine that with a very large medial rectus resection. So it's a good point, um, but anything can be done if you have the right tools, right? I don't think that the technique itself is the challenge. I think it's having the right needle. All right, so let's go back to our PowerPoint and we'll get into the next case here. So our next case uh, comes to us from another one of my friends in Cambodia, Dr. Farah Kov. And uh, Dr. Kov and I have worked together for many years and he's doing a great job. And this first case uh, from him is a nine-year-old male who has a history of a head tilt to the left. All right, so head tilt to the left, and the complaint is that the left eye um, goes up when the head is tilted to the right. So what sounds like a positive Bielshowski head tilt test. And so immediately we think of things like superior oblique palsies, uh, et cetera. Um, so here's our collage of images from this case. And you can see he's got a, he does have a bit of a head tilt to the left there. And let's open this case up so we can take a nice close look at it. Back up to our search. And again, this is 257725777. And really, you know, any, any time uh, that you have uh, head postures, I think these are uh, always interesting questions that come up. 
And let's just get to his images. So again, here's his primary position. And I like this preview function where you can scroll through and look at the images. If you need to see something larger, then just open it up um, using that larger icon. And what do we see here? Well, his head is, his chin is, uh, his head is kind of tilted to the left. Looks like his chin is down. And what do we start to think of? We start to think of things like null points. We start to think of vertical strabismus. We start to think of paralytic strabismus. But let's look at his motility in different directions. So that was primary. Here he is in uh, right gaze. Looks pretty good there in right gaze. And let's look at him in left gaze. So here's his left gaze, and we can tell already on the preview that he's a rather um, discrepancy, large discrepancy in his alignment. So he's got a very large left hypertrophy and left gaze. All right, and then up gaze looks relatively good. Up and to the left looks relatively good. Up and to the right looks relatively good. So I'm really kind of opening up the ones that seem to be abnormal. Down and to the right seems pretty good. Um, straight down, I don't think that's quite perfect. Uh, there you can see that that left eye is not depressing very well. And so then let's also look down and to the left. Down and to the left, really not depressing very well. All right, so. So we have someone with a vertical strabismus, um, abnormal head posture, and he's got this incompetent vertical strabismus. And so this brings us to our next poll question. And when you have these incompetent vertical strabismus cases, um, which test do we find to be um, particularly helpful and, and really want to be comfortable with? Uh, is it the Worth Four Light test, um, the three-step test, is it the ice bucket challenge, or is it the mannequin challenge? Uh, uh, this is uh, this is a bit of uh, being a bit facetious here, um, but it's only because this test is uh, very critical to evaluating complex strabismus cases, and and 100% of you uh, appropriately identified the three-step test as the correct test. And, and I want to talk about that because I see that a lot of people aren't real comfortable with that. In this particular case, um, uh, I want to show you his head tilt test and I, because I think it's rather interesting here. And I've got it open already. You see we've been able to attach some uh, videos as well. So here's a, a video of this patient. And tilting to the left, he looks pretty good. Tilting to the right, he gets a large left hyperdeviation. All right, so right, or rather left, right head tilt, he gets a large right deviation, right hyper, or left hyper. All right. Now the, the three-step test. Uh, here you can see in this case, I was discussing this with Dr. Kov and showing my technique um, for um, how, to, uh, how to interpret this testing. And basically the three-step test has exactly that. You can see one, two, three, three steps. And so let's go through the three-step test with this particular patient. Uh, so to do that, I'm gonna go back up to his collage here and then come back to my PowerPoint so we can see this. All right. So the very first thing we do is, uh, is I'll bring up the whiteboard. The very first thing I do when I see these, these patients is I'll plot out the muscles. So uh, we're going to have right eye over here. And we're going to have left eye over here. And we're going to plot out the cyclovertical muscles. So the superior rectus takes the eye up and out, the inferior rectus takes the eye down and out, and the inferior oblique 
takes the eye up and in. And the superior oblique takes the eye down and in. Okay. And then I do the same thing over here. IO. The SO. And the SR. And the IR. Okay, so why these? These are all the cyclovertical muscles that, um, that will uh, produce positive head tilt tests. All right, so in this particular patient we had, uh, he had, um, looked like he had a left, he has a left hyper. So a left hyper, um, a left hyper is, uh, is possibly a weakness of his depressors. All right, so we circle the two depressors on the left eye. Now a left hyper is the exact same thing as a right hypo, correct? So if it's a right hypo rather than a left hyper, that could be a weakness of the elevators on the right eye. So we circle those two. So identify which eye is hyper and then circle um, the uh, depressors on that side. Now our patient, we now want to know is the um, hypertropia worse in left or right gaze and we saw that in right gaze it looked pretty good in left gaze he was really out of alignment so we know that we have to be dealing with a weakness of a muscle that works in left gaze so back to our whiteboard uh, we circle those that are working in left gaze left gaze left gaze all right and then the final step is um, is his hypertropia worse with a right head tilt or left head tilt? And we had a video that showed us that he was worse with right head tilt. So we're simply going to then duplicate, um, circle the, the muscles that are working in that right head tilt position. All right, so you're kind of just mimicking where his head posture is. All right, close that video out. So now, now what we see is um, that the intersection of those is on the left eye and it's around the left inferior rectus. So the three-step test, you know, normally we do the three-step test, we're expecting to find that it's a superior oblique palsy and um, that's the most common outcome, but the three-step test works for all the cyclovertical muscles. So in this case, we have something that looks like an inferior rectus weakness on the left side, according to our three-step test. Well, what else do we have um, that would indicate that? Uh, let's let's go back to his primary position. So his chin is down and to the left. Um, people, if they have a paretic muscle, they usually will um, put their head posture in the position of the paretic muscle. So if he's got a weak left inferior rectus, his chin face should be down to the left. And that's exactly where it is. So his head posture is definitely consistent with uh, inferior rectus weakness. Dr. Neely, do you want to just reshare your screen? Yes. Sorry, Lawrence. Thank you. All right. I assume we have it back now. Uh, yeah, almost. Almost. There we go. Yep. Okay. So let's look at his. Um, since I may not have had this on, let's look at his head posture now. Okay. So his chin is down and to the left. So if he has a paretic left inferior rectus, this would be the correct position. He's putting his face down where the eye won't go, so that he's taking that inferior rectus out of play as much as possible to control his diplopia. So his head posture is consistent with what our three-step test just showed us. All right. Um, so then, well, what did we find at surgery? So we've done his three-step test. And we, we feel like it uh, isolates to the left inferior rectus. Uh, now, why is that? Um, I'll, I'll kind of skip talking about uh, Herring's law and the yoke muscles. 
Um, that's we do cover this in the advanced to business webinar, which is recorded and, and available. Uh, but I want to get to as many of our five cases as we can. So let's move through this. And at his operative findings, um, we did do traction testing of his left superior rectus to see if that's why he had a left hyper and it was normal. So it wasn't a restriction of the superior rectus. Uh, but he was found to have a really lax or loose inferior rectus. And on, on the, when it was hooked on the muscle hook, it was visibly floppy. And so that's also consistent with uh, a paresis, a long-standing paresis and atrophy of that muscle. Um, so in this particular case, the inferior rectus was uh, resected, and that was combined with the recession of the superior rectus to improve his hypertropia. So, um, and then we have a second video of his uh, um, head tilt test. Um, so you can see there was our first one. Let's look at it one more time. All right, so this is pre-op, and look how much left hyper he gets. All right, and now let's look at his post-op video. After he's had his inferior rectus resected. And let me run it off here. I've got it already. And here he goes in his right tilt. And you can see we're not really getting very much uh, left hyper now. So um, he appears to be significantly better after that. All right. And that was a, the, the covering of the three-step test is the, the main thing that I wanted to cover with you there. Uh, let me get back to the, the PowerPoint. Oh my gosh, black screen, what's going on? All right. I'm not sure where those are, there we go. Okay, back. All right, which brings us to our next case. And in our next case, uh, we're gonna mix it up a bit. So this is from uh, Dr. Jacoby, friend of mine in South Africa. And um, this first case is a seven-year-old male, or this third case rather is a seven-year-old male. And this, this patient's been noted to have abnormal eye movements since birth, but is otherwise healthy, and has always had a relatively normal head posture but it's been noticed by the, the family that there's a shooting upward of the left eye when the patient looks to the right. So we have what appears to be an upshoot. Um, so let's take a look at this patient. All right, so back up to our search and this Upshooting patient is 25252. Let me open that. And also let me see if we have any uh, new questions. All right, I have nothing pending right now, so I'll get back to the case. And 25252, let's open this one. Take a look at this patient's motility. All right, so seven-year-old boy with an upshoot of the left eye, present since birth. And looking at the motility diagram here, you can see that the right eye um, has all zeros, which means normal motility. And on the left eye, we have some abnormalities of uh, uh, the medial rectus and the lateral rectus, um, minimal abduction and adduction. Uh, so we'll wanna be looking at that on the, uh, on the motility grid here. Uh, primary position. Always look there first, uh, looks pretty good. Let's make a larger picture there. So his primary position, maybe he's got a little bit of a head tilt, but uh, no real apparent strabismus there. That looks pretty normal. Um, he clearly has an abnormality here on left gaze. So he's looking to his left and you can see that the left eye does not abduct. 
All right, so we saw that on the motility grid. He has uh, relatively limited abduction, goes a little bit past midline. I might give that a minus three, let's say. Uh, when he goes the other direction in right gaze, uh, his left eye just about disappears. Let's take a nice look at that. So here, right gaze. Again, he maybe goes a little bit past midline, but mostly what we're seeing is that eye is rotating upward. He's getting a large upshoot. Um, his other gaze positions up and to the left, straight up. Uh, let's go down to the right. You see he's not, not um, adducting very well, not depressing too well. And then down gaze, gets a little bit of a divergence there. And then down and left, uh, not too grossly abnormal, maybe not completely full on the left side. So an interesting upshoot here in right gaze, and then um, some limitation of abduction and adduction. Uh, let's, so let's go back. to our next poll question then. So the third poll question, looking at the motility photos of this patient, what do you feel is the most likely diagnosis? Uh, is this a third nerve palsy with multiple cranial, uh, multiple extraocular muscles involved? Um, is this a fourth nerve palsy giving this big upshoot that we see here? Um, is this a sixth nerve palsy giving the limitation of abduction? Or is this a Duane syndrome? And our audience is voting, and we have nicely, uh, nicely done here. So we have 89% uh, uh, of you believe that this is a Duane syndrome. And of course, there are different kinds of Duane syndrome. Um, and this one has deficiency of both um, abduction and adduction, uh, which is consistent with the type 3 Duane syndrome here. And now this large upshoot. Well, why these upshoots are really interesting. It's not, it's not inferior oblique overaction, although it looks like that. Um, these upshoots really have more to do with um, tightness of that lateral rectus. So here you can see he's not too anophthalmic on the left eye, maybe a little bit, um, but look at how that left eye is rolling up as he looks to the right. And what's what's happening? is that, um, uh, let me come off the screen share here for a second. What's happening is that uh, the lateral rectus is really tight. And so you've got the, the ball of the eye and then a very tight lateral rectus. And so the, the, it's almost like you're taking a ball and pushing it against um, a string or a wire rather than um, something spongy like elastic. So normally the muscles are elastic and when the eye gets rotated, the globe gets rotated against them, it just kind of stays in there. But when that lateral rectus is really tight and the back end of the globe rotates around, it has to roll up or under that really tight muscle. And so that's what's giving these upshoots and downshoots. It's the restriction caused by the tightness of that lateral rectus. And so that's why what we do um, with these um, is a little bit different. Let me go back to my screen share. And the way to eliminate these upshoots and downshoots in Duane syndrome is to um, reduce that tightness and that um, narrowness of the tight lateral rectus. And so uh, what I'd like to do is uh, what's what Dr. Jacoby himself was suggesting might be a good idea, and that's uh, a wide splitting of the lateral rectus. And what you do is you basically, before you put sutures in and disinsert the muscle, I just kind of slide a Stevens hook right in here in the middle um, to get about half of the muscle width, and you just kind of split that. So um, let's see, let's go to the whiteboard. And let's clear this out. All right, so you have your 
your lateral rectus, still on the globe. And what I do is I just reach underneath it with the Stevens hook and just kind of poke through it right there, right behind the insertion. Once I've poked through it from the underside with that Stevens hook, then I run that Stevens hook forward and backward uh, pretty much as far as I can to create a cleft in the muscle fibers. Um, once you've created that cleft, then a lot of times you have to cut it all the way to the insertion here with a pair of Westcott scissors. So you haven't disinserted anything yet. You've simply just made a division in that lateral rectus as far back as you can. Then I take two double arm six O's, one for each half, and secure them um, just like you would uh, normally. So instead of one double arm six O, I've got two sutures, and then disinsert that, and then um, And then that lets you uh, get back to um, being able to split that muscle. Uh, get my screen share back here. We also have another question, Doctor. Yes. Um, let me go to that as soon as I can. There we go. Okay. Let me open up the question here. Uh, so the question is how much to resect the inferior rectus and recess the superior rectus in an inferior rectus palsy case? Well, I don't think there's a, I don't know that that's something you can say there's an absolute answer for. It's one of those where, um, you know, normally when we operate on healthy inferior rectus and um, superior rectus muscles, uh, you kind of expect to get three prism diopters of change per millimeter of recession or resection. So it's kind of a three to one rule. But that's not really going to apply if you have a paretic uh, muscle. It's also not going to apply when you have a, um, a tight muscle. So in thyroid cases, we might expect to get four prism diopters of change uh, per millimeter of recession. Um, so I think um, it's difficult to give you a set answer, and that's one of the things where um, you, it's, the art of this comes in, and but what you do know is that when you have a paretic muscle, you're going to have to do much larger amounts of resection. So, um, a five millimeter resection on a paretic muscle on an inferior rectus is probably not going to be sufficient. Um, but if you're ever in doubt, then you don't do both of them at the same time. You do your large resection on the inferior rectus uh, in that case. And then you can go back and add a recession of the superior rectus later on. So, um, uh, again, I'm sorry there's no distinct answer to that, but just be aware that you're going to get less effect when there's a paretic muscle, and you're going to get more effect when there's a restricted muscle. Okay. All right, so we close that and then um, go back to our screen share. All right, so when you when you do these Y splits, I usually will recess these a little bit. I think when you're splitting the muscle like that, you're probably also tightening it some. So even if I don't need any primary position correction, I will recess that a little bit. A lot of these patients can be exotropic, and so you're frequently combining this with a recession of the lateral rectus anyway. And we're at about 45 minutes now. Let's, uh, let's go on to our next case, I think. The last couple are, are shorter in general. Um, uh, it's another case from Cambodia from my friend Dr. Kov. This is a eight-year-old female with a history of prematurity, so one kilogram birth weight. Uh, this patient has a head tilt to the left and also has been noted to have an exotropia on up gaze, and, but relatively normal alignment and down gaze. But uh, let's focus on the head tilt first. Mm -hmm. So let's launch our next poll question relative to the head tilt. Um, head tilts are always interesting. So what are the ocular conditions that they have to think of when there's an abnormal head posture or head tilt? Um, nystagmus, number one. Uh, Brown syndrome, number two. Uh, superior oblique or fourth nerve palsy is number three, or all of the above. Okay. And, of course, as you're voting, I think we're all going to agree that... Uh, question is probably, the answer is probably uh, all of the above, right. So everyone's in, on the same, in the same uh, frame of mind with this. 
yeah, these are all things that you have to consider. You have to um, go through uh, these diagnostic possibilities. Let's open that case up. All right, so that's 25088. Now, of course, when there are head tilts, um, uh, by far the most common thing when you have a head tilt is that there's a spear oblique palsy, right? 90% uh, uh, of the time when I see someone with a head tilt, it's because they've got a spear oblique palsy. All right. And this patient, um, looking at her again, looking at the primary position, look too bad here in the primary position and uh, maybe she's got a little bit of a right hyper looking at her corneal light reflex um, down gaze it was mentioned that she was pretty good in down gaze so let's look at that yeah she looks excellent in down gaze and then it was mentioned she had exotropia on up gaze so there's a preview and uh, let's go to the larger image I think she's got a moderate size exotropia and up gaze so when you see exotropia, uh, V pattern strabismus, right? So she has more exotropia and up gaze. V pattern strabismus, a lot of times we see that in conjunction with inferior oblique overaction. So we know we want to take a close look at her inferior obliques. Let's look at her superior obliques first. So down to the right looks okay. Down to the left looks okay. Up to the right. And I think I see a little bit of inferior oblique overaction on her left eye here. Uh, I think that this left eye is up a little bit higher than the right. Um, and let's look at up and to the left. And, and also, there's some right inferior oblique overaction here, maybe a little more on the right. So some, maybe some asymmetric inferior oblique overaction. Um, a right hyper, and assuming a left head tilt, um, and some right inferior oblique overaction on right gaze, or rather on left gaze. Those are all things that start to make you think of a right superior oblique palsy, but you know, she does have this inferior oblique overaction on both sides. So it's possible that she just has some asymmetric inferior oblique overaction. Uh, so let's go. Back to our PowerPoint. Okay. And I see there's another question um, waiting and I will get to that in just a second. So uh, we've got this, uh, again, I just wanted to touch on uh, diagramming motility because there are two different formats for diagramming motility. This patient has mild uh, to moderate inferior oblique overaction, and you can see some of us use these H diagrams. This is what I use in my office, um, and other people use kind of what looks like a asterisk or a star, but they're don't they're uh, delineating the same thing. So each termination of a line um, is the primary field of action of one of the extraocular muscles: so superior rectus up and out, lateral rectus straight to the side, inferior rectus down and out, inferior oblique up and in, medial rectus straight in, superior oblique down and in, and then just reversed on the other side. Um, most of this is subjective, so a little bit of overaction is a plus one. A moderate amount of overaction like our patient has is a plus two. Plus three is more than that, and plus four, a lot of times when you have plus four, the eye almost disappears. So like that Duane syndrome case, uh, the upshoot that you saw on that, well, that's not from inferior oblique overaction, that would be a plus four. I mean, the eye just really takes off. With underactions, um, if they don't bury the sclera on the lateral rectus abduction, that's about a minus one. If they can uh, not get to midline even, that's a minus four. And everything else in between is subjective lesser amounts. So just a review of what the motility diagrams are um, so that you can use those on the consultations. Now, how do you take care of this problem? Well, if the obliques are normal and you don't have overaction, then a lot of times just shifting uh, the lateral rectus muscles in this case, you have a little bit of XT, and we use that mnemonic uh, male. So medials get shifted to the apex, 
of the pattern. So we have a V pattern, the apex is the point. Um, if you're working on the lateral rectus muscles, then the lateral rectus gets shifted to the empty space. Empty space on a V is the open end of the V, so the laterals would be shifted upward. However, our patient um, has a little bit of inferior oblique overaction, so we have to do something with the inferior obliques, preferably. We can recess them, we can do a myectomy, or we can do an anterior transposition, which I tend to reserve only for those cases with dissociated vertical deviation. Now, our patient had a right hyper of 15, so there's a fair amount of asymmetry in, in what the primary position deviation is. And it was worse on left gaze and right head tilt. So some might say, okay, well, that's more or less like what you see with a right superior oblique palsy. I'm just going to weaken that right inferior oblique. And that would be okay. That certainly either a recession or a myectomy of the right inferior oblique will probably take care of 15 of right hyper. Um, I suppose my concern would be that since we see some left inferior oblique overaction, you might unmask that and now come back with a, a left hyper postoperatively. So I might choose to do bilateral but asymmetric inferior oblique weakening. You could um, do asymmetric recessions, more on the right than the left, or you could do a myectomy on the right, uh, recession on the left, um, various ways to, to accomplish that asymmetry. And some people would just say, well, I'm just going to do a myectomy on both sides, and it's pretty much self-adjusting and, and it takes care of that hyper and I don't really even have to do it asymmetrically. And so different schools of thought as to how you can go about this. All right, uh, let me go back to the question that is uh, in the queue and then we'll, a couple questions up here. Um, uh, the first question has to do with the Duane syndrome case. Is how can I further, how further uh, can I incise the lateral rectus? Well, I don't, so once the anterior portion of the lateral rectus is easy to, to split. Um, the, this question is, well, how far back can I divide it? Well, um, what I don't do is I don't pass scissors back there to extend the um, division posteriorly. Um, but I think the easiest thing is just to slide the muscle hook back. And you'll feel that at some point, uh, as you, especially as you get closer to posterior tenon's exit, um, the muscle hook doesn't slide anymore. So, you're really not dividing the entire muscle. Um, you're dividing the anterior half of the muscle, and that's why it's a Y split. Um, so we're doing a Y split, not a V split of the lateral rectus. So just try and slide it back um, until you feel enough resistance that you feel like you should stop. All right. Um, next question is from Dr. Gebrel. In Duane, are they the same parameters of tight lateral rectus recession? Um, so if I'm recessing a muscle for a Duane syndrome, do I use the same formula that I would for exotropia normally? No, um, I would be more likely to use numbers that would be what I would expect with a thyroid case. So in thyroid cases, um, you expect larger amounts of change per millimeter of recession. And again, there are no tables for this, um, but uh, you know, if an eye is, one way to do this is if an eye is restricted and you can't get it to the primary position, then, then simply um, uh, disinserting the muscle, putting the eye in the primary position and reattaching the muscle in that position is one way to handle these in either Duane or thyroid cases. Uh, but just know that you're going to get a larger amount of effect. Um, and then another question about how to grade an inferior oblique recession. So having to do with this most recent case, um, um, how do you grade an inferior oblique recession? Well, um, a standard or classic 10 millimeter recession would be putting the muscle, um, oh, let's go to the whiteboard. I think that's easiest here. All right, so grading inferior oblique recession, that's a good question because it comes up. And let me close out the question and let's clear this. All right, uh, so first of all, uh, here's our cornea. And I'm going to draw, this is going to be a right eye, and this is going to be the inferior rectus. All right, and then this is going to be the lateral rectus. Not a very good L there, okay. 
And the inferior oblique normally runs about eight millimeters posterior to that and down this way. Okay, that's the normal course of the inferior oblique in the right eye. If I'm doing a, if I want to recess this inferior oblique 10 millimeters, so it's gonna be from there uh, to there, let's say, I don't measure it, okay? I will use landmarks. And so I will, if I want a small or moderate recession inferior of the inferior oblique, again, this is inferior oblique, um, I measure back one, two, three millimeters, and then over one, two millimeters um, from the inferior rectus corner. And, and this is where I sew the inferior oblique on. So now the inferior oblique is here. Okay. So that's, uh, that's the estimation technique we use for a 10 millimeter recession. Um, now, if you want to do a larger recession, that's probably not very good there. If you want to do a larger recession of 14 millimeters, then we have the inferior rectus. And back here is the vortex vein, right along the posterior border of the an inferior rectus. Okay, that's the inferior rectus. And so if you just disinsert that inferior oblique and sew it on straddling that uh, vortex vein, Uh, this is now about 14 millimeters. So that's straddling the vortex vein is about a 14 millimeter inferior oblique recession, um, which is about, I think, the same effect that I get when I do myectomies. So I don't actually do 14 millimeter recessions very often. I'll just do a myectomy because, frankly, once you sew that inferior oblique right here, um, you're not going to reoperate on that. As soon as you hook it, you're going to tear that vortex vein. So. Uh, it's just easier to go ahead and do a myectomy, and that muscle ends up reattached right around here anyway when you do a myectomy, even though you've chopped out that uh, 10 millimeters or so of the muscle. So that's how you grade it, uh, 10 or 14 millimeters. Uh, and it's very, these things are very approximate, so there's, uh, there's not a big reason to uh, uh, measure them precisely. Uh, like we I think sometimes we get carried away breaking stuff down into half millimeters, or even seen people do quarter millimeters. All right, well, that puts us right at the top of the hour, so I think I'm probably going to um, uh, bypass uh, the last case here. And, uh, okay, there we go. All right, so um, again, uh, you know, these are all complex cases and there are never single answers to complex cases. And I think that's something important to keep in mind. Um, what's important is that um, you think about them logically and you look for, you look for um, the right thing. Uh, you know, if you see a head tilt and the chin's up, then you're gonna look see if the muscle in uh, away from that position is paretic or restricted. Um, uh, try to make all the pieces of the puzzle fit together. Uh, know how to do three-step tests, know how to do traction tests. Uh, um, for reasons, for purposes of discussing cases with other people, um, you know, know how to grade the motility diagrams um, get, and give prism diopter measurements. Um, these, that's, easier to give people advice if you have um, some basic measurements and they don't have to be exact and no one's going to grade you on these um, but if you it's nice to have um, primary positions nice to have left and right gaze and up and down gaze and um, on certain cases then head tilts it's relatively uncommon that you need all nine diagnostic positions measured but um, it's nice to have a few measurements to go by um, especially in these incompetent cases like we've seen here today these are obviously complex um, again, um, stay tuned later this week. Uh, you'll be seeing the revised um, template for the consult case uh, where things are condensed and presented in a much more efficient and I think clean manner. I think it will uh, uh, facilitate uh, you submitting cases and it certainly will facilitate um, reviewing cases at a later date. And don't forget that you can review cases. You can search cases. Use the search function in any case that's been closed uh, and open to uh, public viewing, 
uh, you'll have access to that case. Um, I have a couple questions coming in. I'm going to um, look at these before we wrap things up. First question is, how do you differentiate between bilateral asymmetric infibrillic overaction and bilateral asymmetric oblique palsy? All right, so how do you differentiate infibrillic overaction from a oblique palsy, basically? Well, um, they're, in some ways, they're the same thing. Um, I guess the big difference is when you have a superbleak palsy, say something acquired like from a head trauma, then the superbleaks are usually very, very weak. And, and that's when you pick up lots of uh, excyclotorsion. That's why double Maddox rod testing is so critical because acquired superbleak palsies, uh, bilateral superbleak palsies are usually going to have um, more than 10 degrees, maybe even more than 15 degrees of excyclotorsion. And a lot of times it's worse on down gaze. The case that we had, we didn't have any torsion measurements, uh, but there was no history of trauma or other abnormality. Um, and the amount of infrableak overaction was modest. <clears throat> um, and it was with the V pattern exotropy. A lot of these things are kind of uh, just mild infrableak overaction. Uh, now, is it overacting because infrableaks are pulling too hard, or is it overacting because the superior obliques aren't pulling enough? Is it overacting because of orbital asymmetry and orbital dynamics? Uh, you know, we don't really know that. We know that um, it's probably um, can be multifactorial. Um, but basically, that's why torsion, I think, is so critical. Because if someone has 15 degrees of excyclotorsion, we don't operate on the inferior obliques. We, we do something that's going to be a little more uh, torsion appropriate. All right. Uh, next, and I'll uh, make this the final question, then we'll close things out. Can the inferior oblique after myectomy reattach and act in an undesirable action? What do you do in this case? Uh, yeah, so can the, after you do a myectomy, so we're cutting a piece of the inferior oblique out and we're just letting it go. Um, can it reattach? The answer is yes, and it routinely does. I expect that it does in all cases. And sometimes it uh, reattaches in a position that's still producing a lot of effect. Um, when you go back and reoperate on these, you can always find an adherent scar where the inferior oblique um, is either back on the globe in a recessed position or where there's a band of scar tissue connecting the globe to the inferior oblique. So if I have someone with residual inferior oblique overaction after a myectomy, particularly if it was a bilateral and now it's asymmetric, um, I'll go back and I'll explore that inferior oblique and I will re-myectomize it. Uh, to help avoid this kind of reattachment, some people when they do the myectomy will take a small suture like an 8-0 vicryl and they will suture across the exit through posterior tenons capsule. So you, you, you've got your inferior oblique, you amputate it and cut it at posterior tenons capsule and then you suture posterior tenons capsule opening closed so that that inferior oblique doesn't return to the globe and form scar tissue there. So um, uh, that is another way that you can do that. But always, if there's residual action, go back and explore it before you do another surgery um, to help with that hyper. Because more oftentimes than not, you'll find a little adherent band that you can take care of. All right. So again, thank you for everyone's questions and your time. And uh, again, this and all the other webinars are available, uh, recorded. Uh, at the CyberSite homepage and um, take a look at the list of upcoming uh, webinars. There's a really exciting, uh, great variety of things coming up and I uh, wish everyone a, a pleasant day. Thank you.